Well, if you have a Bible, and I hope you do, I invite you to open with me to Philippians chapter 3. I encourage you to pull those notes out from your celebration guide. It'll be our guide together today. I think the greatest challenge I faced this morning is looking back over the last month at all the Lord has been teaching me and resisting the temptation just to pour it out all on you at once. So I'm going to do my best not to. Uh, this outline, I'll go ahead and guarantee you we're not even going to get close to finishing today. We're going to dive into this text that is so rich, so potent. I think one of the theme passages in all of Philippians, maybe in all the New Testament, about what it means to be a Christ follower, what does it mean to follow Christ, and I want us to dive in and see that this morning, because this text, I really do, do believe, summarizes a lot of the things the Lord has been teaching me. My time in the Word, my time reading, reflecting, you know, you sit in an apartment in Kazakhstan for too long, you, you have a lot of time to think about things, and I think if I had to sum up the one thing the Lord has been teaching me over and over and over again is I want my life to count. You have time to reflect and to evaluate when you step away from the busyness of the world that you live in. And you look at it and you say, I don't, I don't want to waste my life. I want my life to count. And then even yesterday when we were on the plane on the way into Birmingham, I'm sitting there holding Caleb asleep in my arms, Heather's asleep on my shoulder. I look at these two faces and I think I want my life to count for him, for her. I think about the family and friends that were waiting for us at the airport. I want my life to count for them. Think about you. I thought about you a lot. Think about this church. I want my life to count for this church. I want my life to count for you. Think about the city that we were in, Caleb City, about 300,000 people, a small handful of known believers. The parting gift we got when we left Kazakhstan was a little hat that it's customary for Muslim boys to wear when they go to the mosque. I want my life to count for that city and for the hundreds and thousands of other cities like it. And amidst it all, just to think about the faithfulness of God, His provision every step of the way, maybe superseding everything else, I want my life to count for His glory. I don't want to waste the life that's been entrusted to me. And I'm guessing, I'm guessing that's a truth that rings home across this room. We want our lives to count. And so one truth is going to penetrate our time in this text over the next couple or the next three Sundays. We'll see how long we're going to be here. But one truth is going to penetrate it all. And it's this truth. God wants to raise up men and women in his church whose lives count for his glory on the landscape of human history. God longs to, desires to raise up men and women in his church whose lives count for his glory on the landscape of human history. That word count is going to be mentioned three different times in the text we're about to read. This is Paul stepping back and evaluating his life. Paul stepping back and giving us a picture of what it truly means to be a Christ follower and the the truths that we're going to see unfold in this text, I'm convinced, will penetrate our Christianity to the core. They will shake us to the core because they are deeply profound, life-changing truths. So let's see them unfold. Let's soak in every word. Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. It is a safeguard for you. This is kind of funny here in Philippians chapter 3. Paul starts off and says, finally, but he's still got half the book to go. Kind of like preachers do that, you know. So we're going to close out with this, and then like an hour later, you're still there. Well, again, I'm going to try. I know you guys want to go to lunch. I've got a little guy waiting for me at home, so we're going to try to get through this. Look at verse 2. He starts to address a problem in the church. He says, watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. 
For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings and becoming like him in his death and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, and I, do not, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. What I want us to do is I want us to take Paul's reevaluation here in Philippians 3, and I want us to see his example and look at four characteristics of men and women whose lives have counted for the glory of Christ on the landscape of human history. Four characteristics. The first one is this. If we want our lives to count for his glory, people like this treasure Christ above everything this world has to offer. They treasure Christ above everything this world has to offer. Now, we're not even going to be able to dive into the first few verses in depth in this chapter. But what Paul is doing from the very start is he's, he's addressing a problem in the church that had arisen because of a group of people called Judaizers. And basically, these were people, Jewish Christians, at least they claimed to be Christians. But their, their practice was to go into situations where Gentiles were coming to faith in Christ, and they would start telling all the Gentiles all the things they needed to do in order to become Christians. Well, if you're going to be circumcised, if you're not a Jew, well, then you need, or if you're going to become a Christian, you're not a Jew, you need to be circumcised. If, if you're a Gentile coming to faith in Christ, well, then you need to start following this Jewish rule or this Jewish regulation or this Jewish practice. You need to start doing these things. And they would pull out their list of things that Gentiles needed to do in order to come to faith in Christ. And as a result, they were hindering the advancement of the gospel throughout the Gentile world because they were, they were putting all these rules and regulations that were masking the, the gospel that is by grace through faith alone, which is what Paul is talking about here. And so Paul uses some pretty fierce terms to describe them. He says, watch out for those dogs. Kind of some irony there because that's what they would refer, Jews would refer to Gentiles as dogs. And so Paul turns it around on him. He says, you guys are the dogs, mutilators of the flesh. That's not a kind term to call someone else. So that's what he does. That's how he describes the Judaizers. And then he comes to verse 4. In the second half of verse 4, he says, If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Now, you've got to catch it. This is a great picture, and you don't get it as much in the English, but in the original language of the New Testament, this is like Greek trash talking here, okay? Paul's talking a little smack here. He says, if anyone else thinks he has reasons, and there's a major emphasis on anyone else. In other words, he's like, if any other man, anybody else, anywhere, thinks he has anything that can match what I've got when it comes to, to being favored before God or having righteousness before God, I challenge him to step up to me. So he's calling anybody out. You come up to me, and I guarantee you, I will knock you out of the ballpark with all the things I have in my corner. And what he does is he lists seven different things that could be split up into two main categories. One is things that he had received just by birth, things that he didn't have anything to do with, but some, some things that he had been given to him he had received. Second are things that he had achieved, things he had worked for, his achieved righteousness. And what I want you to do is read that list with me, and then I want us to think about him in five different groups that he's really emphasizing here. He says, first, circumcised on the eighth day. Second, this is in verse 5, of the people of Israel. 
Third, of the tribe of Benjamin. Fourth, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. Fifth, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. Sixth, as for zeal, persecuting the church. And seven, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. He gives the list. And then, after he gives the list, he comes to verse 7, and he said, whatever was to my prophet, which is a reference to all the things he had mentioned just before, all of these things that I've mentioned, I consider them loss for the sake of Christ. So what he does is he gives a list of things, and then he says, all together, they come up to one big loss, one big zero. And so what I want you to see here in Philippians chapter 3, verse 4 and 5, is a list that Scripture gives us of treasures of the wasted life. Wasted life because Paul comes to the end, the Bible tells us they're all a loss, wasted. Let's think about what they are. First of all, the many treasures of the wasted life. First is family heritage. He talks about his family. I was circumcised on the eighth day. That's something that would only happen if you were in a strong Jewish family. That's when it was customary for them to, to do that as early as possible. So Paul wasn't adopted into the, to this Jewish family later on. From the very beginning, he was thick in Jewish heritage, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel. Not just of the people of Israel, he gets even more specific of the tribe of Benjamin. And you go back to the Old Testament and you see the tribe of Benjamin was an extremely significant tribe in the people of Israel. It was the tribe of Benjamin when other tribes were were turning away from the Davidic throne. It was the tribe of Benjamin that stayed faithful to David. It was the tribe of Benjamin, did you realize, that gave the nation of Israel its first king. The first king of Israel's name was what? Saul. Anybody know what this guy's name was before he wrote Philippians? Saul. Very possible that he was named after the first king of Israel that came from his tribe. So his family heritage was was strong. He comes to the the end of that first part, and he says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. You don't get any more Hebrew, any more Jewish than I get. So he had a strong family heritage. Second, social status. Second, treasure of the wasted life, social status. This goes back to the tribe of Benjamin stuff. This is the tribe you look back in the book of Judges, and you see how the tribe of Benjamin included the land that surrounded Jerusalem, which had the temple inside it, as a result, the tribe of Benjamin was, was prestigious, maybe even more prestigious than, than a lot of the other tribes. So here Paul was. He's from the tribe where there's kind of an upper echelon mentality. He was at the pinnacle of Jewish social life. Number one, family heritage. Number two, social status. Number three, biblical knowledge. The next thing he says is in regard to the law, a Pharisee. Now, we've got to be careful at this point because... Many of us who've read the New Testament, parts of it, especially in the Gospels, we have a negative impression of Pharisees. We almost think of them as hypocrites, which in many ways they were, and Jesus exposed that. But we've got to realize that in this day, Pharisees were extremely well respected. When when you think about people who love the Word and know the Word, that's how Pharisees were viewed. These are are guys who know the law, the Word, backwards and forwards. They love it. They meditate on it day and night, just like the Old Testament tells them to do. They got it memorized. They follow it. Their lives reflect the law. Everything was devoted to the law. Paul said, I was a Pharisee. Biblical knowledge had it to the core. Paul knew the Word. He loved the Word. Fourth, religious activity. The next thing Paul says is, as for zeal, persecuting the church. Not only was Paul a nominal part of the Jewish religion, the Jewish faith, he was a zealous member of Judaism. He was so zealous that he went out persecuting the church that in Acts chapter 7, when we see the first Christian martyr, the people are laying things at the feet of a man named Saul. He's right there. He was zealous. He went throughout these areas persecuting Christians who had turned against Judaism. He was zealous in his religious activity. The many treasures of the wasted life, family heritage, social status, biblical knowledge, religious activity, and then fifth, a moral lifestyle. A moral lifestyle. Legalistic righteousness, which basically is a term that basically means I follow the rules, do things right. He says, I'm faultless. I am blameless. It's almost like he is challenging them to show an area of his life that is not right where he has not followed the rules and the rituals that he was supposed to follow. So there's the list, the many treasures of the wasted life, family heritage, social status, biblical knowledge, religious activity, and a moral lifestyle. I want you to look at that list with me. I want to ask you a question. What do you see that all five of those things have in common? If you'll notice, 
Every single one of those things are good things. You see that? Family heritage, is that a bad thing to have? Love for your family, respect for your family, pride in your family? Social status could obviously be corrupted, but in and of itself, not a bad thing to have. That's a good thing. Biblical knowledge, is that a bad thing to have? No, that's a very good thing to have. Religious activity, zeal, in regard to what you believe, that's not a bad thing to have. A moral lifestyle, Dave, are you saying it's a bad thing to have a moral lifestyle? Absolutely not. All of those things are good things. And that's what we need to see in order to realize, ladies and gentlemen, it was not bad things that were keeping Paul from Jesus. It was good things that were keeping Paul from Jesus. This is huge. Do you catch the gravity of what Paul is saying here? He is telling us that it is possible to love your family and take your family to church and take your kids to church just like your parents took you to church and to have a good reputation in your culture and in your society in the community where you live and to have biblical knowledge, to know the Word, to love the Word, even to teach the Word. On top of that, to not just be involved in church, but to be active in church, zealous in your church activity. And then, on top of all that, to be a very good, decent, moral person. It is possible to have all of those things come to the end of your life and it be written across the top of it, wasted. That's what he's saying here. All of those things are treasures of the wasted life. Now, some of us are thinking, well, if those are treasures of the wasted life, then what, what in life counts? Well, I'm glad you asked. Paul comes to the end of this list. He groups them all together, and he says they are one loss, one big zero compared to one thing. And the one thing is the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, the many treasures of the wasted life, family heritage, social status, biblical knowledge, religious activity, a moral lifestyle, the only treasure of the life that counts is Christ. The only treasure of the life that counts is Christ, Paul says. Christ is the decisive difference. You look at verse 7 and 8, and you see in the very beginning of these verses, they're parallel. Paul says, whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss, in verse 7. He says almost the exact same thing in verse 8. What is more, I consider everything a loss. Whatever is my profit, everything. I consider them a loss. And then right in the middle, we see the difference. For the sake of who? For the sake of Christ. And he repeats this over and over and over again. It is redundant all the way through verse 11. He says, I consider it all a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. For whose sake I have lost everything for his sake. It's all rubbish so I can gain Christ. I want Christ. I want his righteousness, he says in verse 9. Verse 10, he says, I want the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. I want to be like him in his death. Over and over again, Paul says that Christ is far greater than all of the good things in this world piled together into one. They don't pale in comparison to his greatness. The only treasure of the life that counts is Christ. So, we need to step back at this point and realize what Paul, what Scripture is teaching us here about what it means to be a Christ follower in this room. To be a Christ follower, according to Philippians chapter 3, means that we, we discover that Jesus Christ is a treasure chest of holy joy. And we take everything and everyone else in our lives and we write over the top of it loss without him everything everyone the most cherished family relationships our reputation even the good things that religion says we need to do our morality all of it we write one big word across it capital letters loss he even he even says it's it's rubbish i consider them rubbish this is a very interesting word in the original language of the New Testament. We don't, one of those areas where we don't get the full meaning here because it's, it's actually kind of a vulgar word. 
In the first couple centuries of the church, when the early church fathers were translating this, they tried to minimize it. It was almost kind of an embarrassing passage because basically what Paul is saying is, I consider all these things as dung. And some of you think I just said dung in a Sunday morning worship service, and I did. That's, that's what he said. I know that's awkward. It's awkward for me. It's awkward for you. But it's literally what this word rubbish means. Excrement, waste. We won't continue, but you've got the picture. A dirty diaper, okay, all right, all right, you got it. I changed my first one last week. <laughs> Heather had gone, it's just me and Caleb. He starts laughing. <laughs> Says something up. And anyway, okay, ah. Uh. <laughs> Paul comes to the end. Paul comes to the end and he said, all of those things, one big dirty diaper, all of them rubbish, dung. Don't miss the gravity of this statement, what he is saying here, because this is radically different than the kind of Christianity that is being celebrated across our country this morning. It is radically different than the kind of Christianity that is being practiced in lives all across our country this week and sung about this morning. You say, what do you mean, Dave? There are thousands upon thousands of people who this morning have gone to church with their families thinking that their life is going to count because they have brought their kids to church just like their parents did for them. There are multitudes of people who are sitting in seats and pews across our country this morning in nice clothes with nice cars in the parking lot and nice homes waiting for them this afternoon with nice jobs and nice businesses who cannot fathom the fact that it all doesn't matter a bit. It's wasted. There are countless people who are going to Bible study this morning who are listening to the word of God being taught or being preached, and it's all wasted. I'm convinced there are countless people who are preaching the word and teaching the word today in small groups who think that that counts for something, and it's lost, it's wasted. Scores of people who are living high moral lives, who are the most decent, decent of people. And it's all wasted. I'm convinced, based on the authority of the Word of God, that there are people in this room right now this morning who will be surprised and shocked to stand before the Lord one day to give an account for their lives. And we'll hear the words just like Jesus said, or say the words just like Jesus said, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name perform many miracles and drive out demons? Lord, did we not go to church? Did we not serve in church? Did we not participate in church? Did we not take our family to church? Did we not live, lead good lives as mom and a dad? Did we not have a good reputation in our community, even, even knowing the Bible, reading it, studying it? Did we not do these things? Did we not live up to the highest standards we could in comparison with the rest of the culture around us? And it will be written across that life, wasted. It doesn't matter. Those are the many treasures of the wasted life. God, help us to get a hold of this. These treasures are subtly deceptive because they mask our true spiritual condition. The question I want to ask every single person in this room this morning, regardless of your age, regardless of whether you are on staff at the Church of Brook Hills, you are a member of the Church of Brook Hills, or you're a guest here, whether you sing in the choir or you serve in the nursery, whether you teach a small group or you attend a small group, whether this is your first time in church or you never miss a Sunday in church, get through all the rubbish. Get through all the things that don't matter. The question is, do you know Christ? 
Don't let ever, all the other thoughts come in. Well, I've got this and this and this. Well, I prayed a prayer and I signed a card. That's not the question Scripture gives us. Do you know Christ? Do you know him? And is he the treasure chest of holy joy around which everything else in your life revolves so that everything else in this world, even the greatest things in your life, pale in comparison to him? That's biblical Christianity. That's the heart of a Christ follower. Do you know Christ? Somewhere along the way, we have forgotten. And I'm convinced it is one of the most effective, prominent strategies of the adversary. He numbs us and lulls us to sleep with the pleasures of this world and the good things that are around us in this world. And he masks us from seeing this question. And we have forgotten, ladies and gentlemen, that in Christ we have found something worth losing everything for. God, help us to recover this truth. We have found something worth losing everything for. That's what he said in verse 8. Not just the things I've listed. I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. Now, is this just, just Paul talking here? No, this is Jesus. This is him saying, if anyone's going to come after me, he must lose everything. Father, mother, brother, sister, take up your cross. Take up death and follow me. What a radical statement. Turn with me back to Matthew chapter 13. I want you to see this truth from Jesus' mouth. We have found something worth losing everything for. Look at Matthew chapter 13, uh, verse 44. It's the first, first book in the New Testament, right before Mark and Luke and John. If you need to use your table of contents, please feel free to do that. Look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. Jesus said this, two short little parables, short little pictures, but they're so thick. What an incredible picture. Listen to this. The kingdom of heaven, which is the life of the Christ follower, is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and sold all he had. He didn't begrudgingly go sell all he had. Oh, no, I found this treasure. Now I have to give up these things. No, he was glad. Get him out of here as soon as possible. I want to sell it all with joy so that he could buy that field. Second picture. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. You might write in the margin, your Bible is right next to that passage, we have found something worth losing everything for. This is a core truth of what it means to be a Christ follower. To find a treasure, a value that is so infinitely great, surpassing greatness. That is redundant language in the New Testament in Philippians chapter 3. He is making a point. The surpassing greatness, something so infinitely wonderful, infinitely beautiful, that even the best things this world has to offer, I lose them for his sake. I risk them. I sacrifice them for his sake. All the good things that we've talked about, family, socially, biblically, religiously, morally, all those things. Isn't this the cry of men and women throughout Scripture, throughout church history, I've been reading a good bit over the last month in Exodus and in Job. Looking at, looking at Job, a guy who one day lost it all, everything, all of his possessions, all that he owned, all of his wealth taken out from underneath him, and not just the things, the people. What agony! 
We can't read Job, Light, Job lightly when we realize all of his children died just like that. All of them. Not one of them left. The only person left is a nagging wife. And Job has nothing. Nothing. Not even his health anymore. He's got boils all over his skin. And in Job chapter 19, he says, I know that my Redeemer lives and he will stand for me. I've lost it all, but I've got my Redeemer. Moses. It says he led the people of God to much disgrace to himself. He could have had all the treasures of Egypt. Hebrews chapter 11 says he, he, he forsook, he left behind all the treasures of Egypt and he counted it, listen to this, he counted it wiser to suffer disgrace for the sake of Christ. And yes, Hebrews 11 says for the sake of Christ. It's kind of weird because Moses is in the Old Testament, but he knew the infinite greatness of God and the promise that he had given in his salvation through Christ. Moses counted disgrace for the sake of Christ, suffering for his sake as better, infinitely better than all the pleasures of Egypt combined. Hannah, a text that has been real, especially for Heather and me, praying through her desire to have a child. And as she prays, she says, I know that my God has power to give life and to take life, and I trust in him. In her agony, she has him. It's the cry of men and women throughout biblical history. Now, so, some of us might think at this point, well, okay, Paul, Moses, Job, pretty sharp guys. I'm just not there spiritually. I'm not on that pedestal spiritually. Let me show you a guy in Scripture who you may not even recognize. Go back to Philippians Go back to Philippians with me, and I want you to see Philippians chapter, chapter 2. Go back to the passage right before the passage we're reading. And I want to show you kind of a no-namer in Scripture. You might recognize the name when you see it. You might not. Look with me at Philippians chapter 2, verse 25. Paul says, I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, Let's say that one together. One, two, three. Epaphroditus. I'll tell you what name was not on the possibilities for Caleb, okay? <laughs> Epaphroditus. Now, who is this guy? Let's know what it says about him. My brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. A little background here. Paul, we remember, is writing from prison, house arrest, and the Philippian church had sent this dude, Epaphroditus, to come and support him and encourage him and to bring resources to him. So they'd send Epaphroditus to care for him. Verse 26, he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and he almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. Welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor men like him. Now listen to this, verse 30. You might underline it, great verse. Epaphroditus, because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help you could not give me. And Paul says it, says it actually two times in this passage that Epaphroditus almost died. We don't know why he was ill, how he was ill, or what exactly his illness was. What we do know that he was sick. Why was he sick? because of the work of Christ that he had given himself to, because of what he was doing, his health had suffered very bad to the point where he was on the doorstep of death. And then it says he, he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life. Now, you might circle that phrase because this is, this is thick. This, this is actually only one word in the original language of the New Testament. It's parabola sumonominos, okay? Isn't that a great word? You get that down? It's 16 letters, and it is packed with meaning. The word literally means to wager, almost as if in a game of chance, to gamble. This is a term that was used to describe gambling in that day, to wager. In a 
game of chance, to gamble something. So here we've got a picture of Epaphroditus, God's gambler. In the best of ways, the gambler. What did he gamble? He risked his life. He risked everything to go and support Paul, to be a part of the mission the church had been given by Christ. Why would Epaphroditus risk it all? He knew what he was getting into. He knew what it would cost him. Why would he do it? He decided to do that because he knew the surpassing greatness of Jesus Christ. And so he realized this is not a, really a gamble at all because compared with his greatness, anything is worth losing, even my life. Does that sound familiar? Philippians 1, 21, to live is Christ and to die is gain. We'll look at that some more next week when we get into the rest of Philippians 3. So we got a picture of Epaphroditus. You know, it's really neat. In the first few centuries of the church, after this, there was a group of people in the church that formed together in a group called the riskers or the gamblers. And they used the same Greek word that was used to describe Epaphroditus to describe themselves. They followed his example. And what they would do was this group would say, we're going to go to the places nobody else will go. They went into the prisons. They went in to care for the people who were sick, not just people who were sick, but those who were sick with the most contagious of diseases that nobody else wanted to be around. They said, we're going to risk our lives to help these people, to care for these people. In the third century, in uh, Carthage, North Africa, there was a severe plague. Thousands and thousands of people were dying. And the pagan inhabitants of Carthage got to the point where they would, even family members would not be near them if they had the plague. Even after they died, they would not go to care for their bodies and bury them because they didn't want to risk getting the plague. And it was a group of believers, gamblers, riskers, who said, we're going to rise up. Cyprian of Carthage, the bishop of the church there, got together Christians, and they would go around from person to person, house to house, and they would care for the people that nobody else cared for. People who were suffering from the plague, they went and cared for, and some of them got the plague as a result. They risked it all. Do you see the picture here of New Testament biblical Christianity? This kind of Christianity holds on to no one in this world. Holds on to nothing in this world. That whenever it comes to choosing between something and Christ, we always choose Christ. Someone in Christ, we always choose Christ. Or when the people or the things in this world the good people, the good things, the things that mean most to us are taken away. We never lose our joy. We never lose our lives. Why? Because Christ is our life. He is our treasure. Does that mean there's not pain when you lose? Absolutely not. There is deep pain. We've got tears from Jesus Christ himself when he knelt in the Garden of Gethsemane. We've got real pain, not an artificial, oh, I've got joy even though I don't have anything. It's a real pain, but it's a pain that says, Christ is still my treasure, and as long as I've got Christ, I've got everything I need. Is that the kind of lives that we're living in this room? Is that the kind of perspective we have? Or are we hiding behind the many treasures of the wasted life, living a life that says, I'm going to have Christ and these treasures? That's what the Judaizers were doing. We'll follow Jesus, but we'll also do this and this and this and this. We'll have this and this and this and this. And Paul says, it's all rubbish. All I've got is Christ, and that's all that matters. You take away everything from me. Imagine how frustrating it was for these, the, the, the people in, who were caring for Paul in this Roman jail cell, for him to look at them and say, you know, if you kill me, that's actually better for me. If you let me live, that's going to be the really good thing too. You do anything to me and I'm happy because I've got Christ. God, help us to risk it all. God, help us to stop playing games with the surpassing greatness of Jesus Christ. God, help us to sacrifice every treasure of the wasted life. Ladies and gentlemen, how are we ever going to impact inner city Birmingham with the gospel 
if we hold on to our comforts and our social status and our families more than we hold on to Christ. We won't do it. How are we ever going to accomplish the Great Commission? If the least reached parts of the world today are the most dangerous places in the world today. The reaction to this point has been, well, if they're the most dangerous places, then we need not go there. We need to stay away from there. And the kind of Christianity that we're seeing in Philippians 3 is radically different. It says we're going to the most dangerous places. And we're risking our lives. And we're risking our families. And we're risking our jobs. And we're risking our finances. We're risking it all so that Christ would be exalted in us. We want to gain Christ. We want to know him completely. And we want the world to see that he is a treasure of lasting value. And you take anything from us and we will be pleased with our Savior. That's much bigger than a Sunday morning routine. One of the biographies I had the opportunity to read over the last month was of one of my favorite missionaries, actually, uh, a guy for whom Caleb is named in part, Caleb Thomas Platt. His, uh, his middle name comes from my dad, my hero. If I could be half the dad that my dad was to be, was to me, then I would have more than succeeded in my relationship with Caleb. His first name, Caleb, come from the picture in the Old Testament of a bold follower of God who stood on the brink of the promised land when the people were having to decide whether they would die in their religion or die in their devotion. He said, let's die in our devotion. Let's go into the promised land. He was risking it all. But then, even his initials, C.T., one of my favorite missionaries from Church history is a guy named C.T. Studd. Pretty cool name, huh? <laughs> kind of has a ring that C.T. Platt doesn't have, but that's all right. We do what we can. C.T. Studd. Talk about risking it all. One of my favorite quotes from C.T. Studd. He said, some wish to live within the sound of church or chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. This is a guy who was a wealthy English athlete, had lots of money. And when he came to faith in Christ and he realized the joy of Christ, he literally sold all of his possessions, gave them all away. He, after that, almost like he was being tempted by the adversary, received an inheritance from his father and he gave it all away. He had no money to his name. And he went off to China where he began sharing the gospel with unreached peoples there. About 10 years and a wife and four children later, he came back to England and he prepared for his next mission. He left and he went to India and he lived there, penetrating unreached people groups with the gospel. He came back and then when he was older, did not store up treasures for retirement. did not count his 401k and say, okay, I've made it, I've done my work. He left for Africa. He said, this is the most unevangelized place in the world today, and I want to go and proclaim Christ, risked his life, and went into inland Africa. During the last 13 years of his life, he saw his wife for one night because she was raising funds to support what he was doing there, to see their letters they wrote to each other and their partnership in the gospel, even from a distance. I'm not advocating this, but golly, what an amazing picture. He faced a lot of resistance from the church. The church said he had kind of lost it. He was risking too much. They said, don't go to China, don't go to India, and don't go to Africa. What kind of difference can you make on the continent of Africa? Wait until another time. Wait until other people will go with you. Of course, nobody else was willing to go with him. And he wrote this, kind of a rallying cry. I want you to hear what he said. He said, believing that further delay would be sinful, some of God's insignificance and nobodies, 
That's what he called himself. Isn't that a great new name for a group? We're God's insignificance and God's nobodies. We have decided on certain simple lines according to the book of God to make a definite attempt to render the evangelization of the world an accomplished fact. Too long, listen to this, too long we have been waiting for one another to begin. The time for waiting is past. The hour of God has struck. In God's holy name, let us arise and build. We will not build on the sand, but on the bedrock sayings of Christ, and the gates and minions of hell shall not prevail against us. Should men such as us fear before the whole world, I before the sleepy, lukewarm, faithless, namby-pamby Christian world. He said namby-pamby. We will we will dare to trust our God. We will venture our all for him. We will live and we will die for him and we will do it with his joy unspeakable singing aloud in her hearts. We will a thousand times sooner die trusting only in our God than live trusting in man. And when we come to our position, we realize the battle is already won and the end, and the end of the glorious campaign is in sight because we will have the real holiness of God not the sickly stuff of talk and dainty words and pretty thoughts. We will have a masculine holiness, one of daring faith and works for Jesus Christ. I don't want to come to the end of my life, and it is possible for me to come to the end of my life preaching every week and leading a good family and being zealous in religion and in the middle of it all to have it wasted because I missed the whole point. I don't want to come to the end of my life and have wasted written across the top. I want to come to the end of my life and see that all things have been counted loss and Christ is my treasure. I want us to be a church. I want us to be a church. And we could be a church that could go throughout the next 20, 30, 40 years and do some great things and have some great programs and have some great ministries and over the top have it written, wasted. I want our church to count for his glory on the landscape of human history such that we say we consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. Now that seems like too great a risk. It seems like too great a gamble. But here's the beauty of it. When we consider everything a loss and when we treasure Christ, it's then and only then that we learn to honor these things best and to use these things best. And all of these good things now become avenues through which we treasure Christ more. What a radically different way to look at life. God, help us to risk it all. Help us to realize that Christianity, which costs nothing, produces the same. God, help us to realize that it is better to lose our lives than to waste them. God, we praise you for the surpassing greatness of Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, we honor you today as the one who paid it all, who paid the price for our sins so that we might know you. Lord Jesus, help us to see the treasure that you are. Help us to value you for who you are. God, take our eyes, we pray, off of even the best things of this world to see you. And then in turn, help us to, to take the best things in this world and to use them for your glory and to trust and to treasure you more than anything else. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.